lot of different videos I could have chosen, but the, one I, the reason why I chose their official music video is because of the pictures. I could have asked every one of you to bring a picture today, and you would have all been able to have brought a picture of a loved one who is no longer imagining. There you go. <clears throat> They're no longer imagining. And so we've dealt with a lot of it, and uh, you get to hear it. Now, Jeff, I think we're recording, I believe we are. Okay. I had a few last Sunday come up to me and say, listen, I won't be here, <clears throat> so if there's any way to record it, and my devil shoulder said, no, just out of pure hate, we ain't going to record nothing for you. You miss what the Lord has for you, starve. But the angel on this side said, now, 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 now. Uh, I didn't never, I never met her, but I have heard so much about her that it has actually become that voice, and I've never even heard her speak. But that my angel on this side's name is Mama Lucy, um, because... <laughs> I've heard so much over the years about her, never said a bad word about nobody. So she'd be the one to say, now, now, you, you record it anyway. So we're going to record it for all those heathens. I told Jeff that uh, when we get to heaven, I just believe that the Lord's going to come to a moment where he's going to say, now, <clears throat> everybody step out of the way. And for all those faithful people who were in church on Memorial Day Sunday and Labor Day Sunday and Fourth of July Sunday, y'all get to come up to the front and get an extra gold star. And it'll be real gold then. It'll be real gold. So, uh, but listen, a couple of things to share with you. Um, we are continuing to kind of play this thing by ear, and after talking with both of my nursery and preschool leaders and some parents, uh, we have decided not to officially open our nursery preschool uh, until at least the 19th. Um, so just keep that in mind with, with babies. I think they are going to make a nursery room available for a parent who might need an, as an unstaffed room where the parent can go, that you might can do that. Also... Starting Wednesday night, uh, I'll have a table out there. Uh, with all of this stuff going on, we haven't really been able to do a whole lot. Uh, but Pastor Pete uh, Machave, his last Sunday was last Sunday, and I forgot to mention it. He was June the 30th was his last day working with us. Uh, he will be speaking to you in July, later in July. Um, I wanted him to share a thank you message with you folks, his church home, and Lisa and and so on July 19th, that's a Sunday, <clears throat> we're starting this Wednesday night, we will have a blessing table uh, out there in the lobby at the photo place. If you want to give a card uh, or write something special uh, to them uh, for uh, that to give to them, we want you to do that um, and, and, and keep them in your prayers and all. And July 19th, we're going to have a little bit of an honor time uh, for uh, Pastor Pete and Lisa uh, he's been the jack of all trades around here. He's been on the praise team, youth ministry, uh, kitchen cook, uh, light repair man, uh, stage build. I mean, he's done about anything you could possibly do. Uh, he, I don't think he served in the nursery yet. I couldn't get him one Sunday in that. Um, but uh, other than that, <clears throat> he's about done it all, and I have been very grateful. We'll share more with you on the 19th. Uh, but you will have a chance to share your heart and, and write a card, and, and in, I encourage you in a, in a card and stuff to give to Pete and Lisa on that 19th. Also, <clears throat> on the last Wednesday night of July is our blood drive uh, from 1.30 to 5.30. We've still got about 40-plus slots um, available. You can go online to the Red Cross and look up our church, and you should be able to find a spot there. Um, I don't know what you've heard. They will not be testing you for corona. Uh, they will be doing temperature checks, but they will also be testing blood for antibodies. Uh, so they will be doing that, but you're not going to have to worry about getting that <clears throat> nose nasal test or whatever. Um, so 
But uh, please, if you have not signed up, many of you do. It's our, we gave an emergency blood drive a few months back on behalf of all of the go- that was going on. But on the 29th, that's our annual blood drive. So make sure you have <clears throat> filled out what you need to fill out and, and signed up for that. But we have been in a series on heaven, and we've been talking about the myth and the mystery and the message. Now, you can go online and um, get caught up on previous messages uh, that we've done. Go to our website and be able to find those if you've not been able to listen to them or been here for them. But let me just do as a quick summary. When we talked about myth a few weeks back, we talked about it from the standpoint of Satan really seeks to convince us that heaven can wait, Uh, that it's a boring place, Um, that maybe it's not even real. And so you don't need to worry about anything but living where you are and living life for you. He's trying to do that with us. But we've talked a lot, and we're going to do some more today, about the mystery of heaven. It's where that song came from. I can only imagine. That means that there's a mystery about what it will be. And verse after verse and story after story in the Bible, it has revealed to us that not only is heaven real, but that there is still a lot of mystery about it. But these stories and these verses that we've read have given us Glimpses have given us puzzle pieces of the truth about heaven. And the message of heaven is really simply this, that it is a real place, and it is a real promise, and you will share in the real presence of God of all ages. Two weeks ago, we looked at what heaven is now. We had Graduate Sunday, last Sunday, so two weeks ago, we talked about what is heaven right now. And during that Sunday, we talked a lot about the resurrected bodies. In other words, when our bodies come back out of the ground and come back to life, according to the Scriptures, why will we need those bodies? And what will they look like? And, and <clears throat> what is the purpose of them? And even though people are entering eternity every single day, There will be a day when the earth erupts with resurrection. Do you hear me? The greatest day isn't the first day we put a man on the moon. The greatest day isn't some other day that you might think of in terms of earthly history. The greatest day in all of history has not even happened yet. And it will happen when the earth erupts with resurrection. The Bible tells us that there will be a day... When the earth will shake and graves will open and the seas will give up the dead and people who have mysteriously disappeared and who have never been found, their bodies will come forth. And there will be an eruption of resurrection. What do you mean by that, Pastor? I mean all things will be restored new. And I want us to have a little bit more understanding of the sequence of events about heaven that will lead us into the day of heaven that's revealed on earth. And so what I'm going to do to start with before I go into into a specific area is I want to give you a little bit of of a sequence of end-time events from what most scholars believe the Scripture predominantly talks about are these events. Now, the first one is kind of made up. It's, It's one that I've kind of made up based on the Scripture, but I call it the rupture. And what do you mean by the rupture? Well, if you go look at Luke 21, 7 through 36, this isn't some man <clears throat> talking. This isn't one of the disciples taking a guess at what's going to happen. This is Jesus, and Jesus is telling you about the end time. He's telling you how the earth will begin to erupt in chaos, in turmoil, that there will be an upheaval of world systems meaning how education and government operates. And there will be an increase and an intensifying of suffering to unprecedented levels. That Jesus is the one who actually says that the planet Earth will groan 
under such intensity. <clears throat> Are you seeing any of it? It says that the seas will churn. And believers will face persecution. I'm going to be talking about that in a few weeks. That there will be divisions right down to the core of family units. Chaos will seem to be the rule of the day. And I call that first stage of the end time events the rupture. That it won't just be normal earthquakes and it won't just be normal storms and it won't just be the normal chaos of evil. There will be an intensification of it. And Jesus is the one talking and in Luke 21 you can read the full description of what he says will take place. But the second event that will happen is after the rupture, after things get to the boiling point, if you will, after things get to that point that it's about to just come totally apart, we have what the Scripture in 1 Thessalonians says is the rapture. And what is the rapture? Well, what that simply means is that's the calling away. That's the ready ones. In other words, God will give the angel the, 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 the trumpet. So now is the time. And he'll look at Jesus and he'll say, you can go to the earth. And you can take out of the earth those that are faithful, those that are ready in heart and mind, those that are living in accordance with the statutes of God's Word. Son, you can go get your brothers and sisters and my children. And there will be a rapture that happens and people will just in the blink of an eye disappear. There is a scripture that describe that. That there will be people that if rapture was to happen right now, I hope I'm the one going uh, so I'm going to use me as the illustration that what would happen is that on the day that the trumpet sounds and Jesus comes from heaven and splits the skies as we know them to take us out, that all that you, if you're left standing, if you're left here, if you're one of those left here, and by the way, just because you walk in the doors of a church don't mean you can't get left. And those that will be left might even be sitting in church and look around and all they would see is my clothes fall to the ground and they would see the place car wrecks planes because Christians are driving and doing different things and they would be lifted up to heaven the rapture would happen and when the rapture would happen it would create such an intensification of chaos and turmoil the rupture would be like the volcano right now we're the volcano that you feel rumbling and you see a lot of smoke coming out of that would be the symbol of the earth today in my mind of all mankind but when the rapture happens when God pulls us out of this earth to take us to heaven then what will happen is that volcano will explode with lava blow the mountaintop off you've seen some of those those illustrations well when the rapture happens it will be such a chaotic time that governments will collapse and it will set the stage for the antichrist somebody will come on the scene and simply say hey listen i know we're in a lot of chaos i know things are crazy right now let me tell you what's happened all those people that left here that wasn't a god there is no god that was ufos they took people out of here we've been we've been invaded they're going to feed the countries a lie and they're going to say, now, the way we defend ourselves against all of that is we give up all rights and all government, and we have one world government, and I should be the one who runs it. And the Antichrist will step forward, and he will seemingly have answers. And all countries all over the world will then give in, and they will surrender their sovereignty, if you will. We would no longer have a president and a congress of this country. They would surrender themselves to that one body and that one person who's over it. And for the first three years of the tribulation period, the tribulation is about seven years, the first three, three and a half years of that, things look great. People are prosperous. People are getting fed. People are, And then suddenly, the spirit in that Antichrist person who his life is sold out to the devil, will take over in a very violent way. And so Revelation chapter 6 through chapter 8 
is where you find, 18, excuse me, you'll find them talking about the tribulation period, what is happening on earth, and how God so loves the people who are left in the tribulation that he will begin to pour out his wrath on evil, but he's also the last cups of grace. It is God trying his best to still reach people before he finalizes the wrath and judgment that will come. And it's called the tribulation, Revelation chapter 6 through chapter 18. And then you would have the overthrow of the Antichrist and his government at the Battle of Armageddon where they will turn on Israel. The whole world will turn on Israel and seek to annihilate and destroy Israel. And when that happens, there will be that battle where Christ will come and he will, with the breath of his mouth, he will destroy all of the Antichrist and all of his government. And it sets up the next stage, which is the thousand-year reign of Christ, the millennial. And that's the one we're going to focus on today. I'm going to try to get through some notes pretty quick. Uh, Hayden asked me if we would make sure we had church cut short today because it was the 4th of July weekend. So, uh, <laughs> so uh, he, got pinned with that. he got pinned with that question anyway. So I'm going to try to run through some things. But we're going to focus on this period right here, the thousand-year reign of Christ. What is happening during that thousand-year reign that Jesus comes to earth and sets up a government destroying the Antichrist? What will happen? And then there's what is called the last resistance against the reign of Christ. In other words, after a thousand years, Satan, who's been bound uh, in, in a prison, if you will, uh, is released from the abyss and is able to tempt people again to lead in a rebellion. Now, why would he do that? Because the people who are born in that thousand years have had no choice. It's kind of been like the garden a little bit, not totally, but they, they've really had to surrender to the rule of Christ that's the every knee will bow. They will surrender to the rule of Christ, though they may not totally like it. And they will be tempted to revolt. And it will be what is called the last resistance. And at that point, God will deliver unto the, the next, uh, uh, next chapter, I guess you will, is the white throne judgment. Not the great white throne, the white throne judgment. And you find that in Revelation 20. And then there is where he will judge Satan and all others. And when he casts them all into what is called the lake of fire, that will be the end of anything that has to do with the evil. And, and it will set up what is called the eternal ages. And the eternal ages, according to the scripture, is when there will be the new heaven and the new earth and the new Jerusalem. And you find that in chapters 21 and 22 of Revelation. And so out of these, we're going to focus our time this morning as quickly as I can and just hit some highlights. Now, here's the good news for all you note takers, okay? You can take notes if you want to, but here's the good news. I'm actually using a format of notes. Some of those things that I've just shared are stuff that I have studied and, and researched and written down for you, but I have going to give you a gift next Sunday. <clears throat> I'm going to give you a binder that has probably 50 pages of notes combined from a lot of different resources. So in other words, I'm going to talk about the thousand year reign of Christ. I might hit 10 points. In these notes, there'll be 100 points that you'll be able to look at. So I'm just giving you highlights. You know how when you go to watch a movie, it just shows you previews? I'm just giving you previews. <clears throat> I'm going to put in your hands uh, next week a notebook that you can have that studies all about heaven. Uh, and and uh, that you can put, that you can use as kind of a reference guide. But for now, what do the Scriptures tell us <clears throat> about the condition of the earth during the reign of Christ, the thousand-year reign of Christ, and what are we going to be doing during that time? Well, first of all, understand that the thousand-year reign of Christ had a purpose, and the purpose is literally a transition. I know this doesn't sound spiritual, but it's a transition uh, from uh, between human government to the eternal ages, to the time of the new Jerusalem and the new heaven and the new earth. And so during that thousand years, Satan's going to be bound up. You can read it in 1 Corinthians 15. And so let me just kind of give you a glimpse of what that thousand year reign is going to look like. Remember the song, I can only imagine, because what I'm about to say to you, you can't fathom. 
We live in a world of sinful hearts and selfishness and chaos and hurt and wounds and, and destruction and dysfunction. We're going to have a hard time trying to fathom what I'm about to tell you, okay? But in a thousand-year reign, people will live without Satan running interference in their lives. He's bound in jail, so to speak. Now, this would be, <laughs> amen to you too, Carter. Now, he said, amen, amen. So, <laughs> uh, it will help usher in, the thousand-year reign will help usher in the greatest age that the world has ever known. It'll be humanity's finest hour since the Garden of Eden. Everything from work to worship will be holy and will be focused on Christ. God will appoint His people to govern, uh, to instruct people in righteousness, to restrain unsound behavior, to reorganize the worship in the human race, to do away with the racial divides that are happening more and more. Jesus will set up His reign on earth leading to the judgment of all the nations. If you want to read something over the next several days, <clears throat> take notes right here. Isaiah chapter 9, Daniel chapter 2, chapter 7, Zechariah chapter 14, Luke chapter 1, Revelation chapter 1. Go home and read those, <clears throat> and you will find that Jesus is setting up His reign on earth uh, Jerusalem will be the capital in this thousand-year reign. It will be the center of the earth. Israel will be the leading nation on earth. It won't be the largest, but it will be the leading nation on earth. Saints, people who have served God, saints with glorified bodies are dispensed throughout the world to reign in positions of leadership and government. Revelation 20. The earth's population during the thousand-year reign is made up of survivors of the tribulation. Wait a minute, Pastor. I didn't think anybody could survive the tribulation. <clears throat> there will be people. Now, listen, let me just tell you something. If you find it challenging to serve the Lord in today's time, don't fool yourself into thinking you're going to serve Him in the tribulation time. Because in the tribulation time, it'll be like World War II for the Jews when they were hiding in caves and sewers and woods. You won't be sitting in your nice, comfortable house telling everybody you're serving the Lord in the tribulation period. You won't be able to get food unless somebody gives it to you. You'll be the homeless, if you will. You'll be living under bridges and hiding out, if you will, during the tribulation period. Listen to what Zechariah 14 tells us about the earth's population during the tribulation period. Everyone that is left of all the nations which came against Jerusalem. He's talking about the tribulation period. That's just an excerpt. He's talking about people who, who have survived the tribulation will go up and worship the Lord. There are people who will survive it. Millions will be saved during the thousand-year reign of Christ. Millions. Joel tells us that, that he will pour out the Spirit like never before. Habakkuk tells us that the earth shall be filled with the knowledge and the glory of Jesus just as the waters cover the earth. That's during the thousand-year reign. The first part of the thousand-year reign will probably be the greatest days of evangelism in the history of the world. People turning to Christ. The Bible tells us, and, the, and His government shall increase. But it's not all going to happen at once. It's going to take time. Uh, one, one writer says that it's conceivable, it's conceivable that people like Billy Graham and Jerry Falwell or Roberts, Rick Warren, will in their glorified bodies help the cause of the knowledge of earth, of knowledge of the Lord in the earth. They will be teachers again. Can you imagine Billy Graham alive again, teaching and evangelizing in the, in the thousand-year reign? 
Why would that be necessary, Pastor? Well, because not everybody in that thousand-year reign is going to be in love with Jesus. It's kind of like right now when you have, let's say, the Republicans have the White House and the Senate and the House. They dominate the government. Or if the Democrats have all three, they dominate the government. So they're the ones in power. They're the ones dictating to everyone. But not everyone likes it. Right? It will be like that during the thousand-year reign. What the Antichrist has tried to set up and mimic in his reign, when he's destroyed by Jesus, Jesus sets up on earth his physical bodily reign as king. So not everybody's ever happy with a king. But listen, do you know that there will be so much difference when Jesus is reigning during that thousand years that even the animal kingdom will be at peace? You do understand that the curse will be reversed. Hallelujah. The curse of sin will be reversed. The Bible tells us that the wolf will lay down with the lamb. That a child will put his hand in the hole of a serpent's nest. That there will be peace in the animal kingdom. The elements will be at peace. There won't be a hurricane season. There won't be earthquakes and tornadoes during Jesus' thousand-year reign. Well, why not? Because he's king, right? And he's already demonstrated the first time on earth that he had control over the elements, right? He will control and command the elements. Prosperity will be everywhere. Health will be the new norm. There will be a healing of the air and the water and the environment. Long life will return to the human family. There will be few deaths during the thousand-year reign. What do you mean by a few, Pastor? Well, except for those who transgress and disobey the word of the Lord. There will still be, now I know this is going to be a little bit hard to believe, but understand something. Even though during the thousand-year reign of Christ, there will still be sin and sinners and there still will be death, this will not be heaven on earth yet. That comes in the eternal ages. But it will basically be where Jesus is reigning and people know it, but they still have free will. But sin will not be what dominates the earth. The power and the presence of Jesus will. It's hard to wrap our minds around it. But listen to it. Isaiah 65 says, no longer will babies die when only a few days old. No longer will adults die before they have lived a full life. No longer will people be considered old at a hundred. Only the cursed will die that young. That's the scriptures. Isaiah 65 tells us that. He also tells us that my people will live as long as trees and my chosen ones will have time to enjoy their hard-won gains. Holiness of heart and life will be taught all over the world. In other words, prayer be in school again. Starting the school day, reading from God's Word and talking about holiness will be a part of that thousand-year reign. Mark, I don't understand how people on earth living under the rule of Christ won't be happy, won't be living right. How will there still be sin and sinners? Well, first of all, you know the Son of God came to earth one time before and not even religious people wanted to believe. Not even religious people were happy. You do know that in heaven, Lucifer was not happy. As in the garden with the first couple and as with the Jews in his first coming, many will love him, but some will leave him to join that final revolt according to Revelation 20. And the white throne judgment of the wicked will convene and the sentence of eternity into the lake of fire will be issued to all of those 
And that will set the stage. God will say, enough is enough. Judgment is past. We enter into the eternal ages. So let's say you're watching a four-part series. Let's say you're, you sit down to binge watch a, a movie series. Let me, let me give you the four parts of this movie. Let me give you a, an overall look at the four parts of this movie. Part one is the Old Testament, from Genesis through the end of the Old Testament. Part two of, the, of this movie series is the New Testament. Part three of this movie series is the thousand-year reign of Christ. And then the final part, part four of this movie series that you would be watching, is what is called the eternal ages. It's what is called the eternal ages. Let me read something for you. Based on Isaiah chapter 65, Isaiah chapter 66, 2 Peter chapter 3, Revelation chapter 21. I told you I'm going to give you all these later. And from other scriptures, here's what we gather. That after the white throne judgment, hell will be cast into the eternal lake of fire. The new Jerusalem, which is in heaven, will come down out of heaven to the new earth. And from that time on, the dwelling place of God will be with the redeemed of man on the new earth and in the new Jerusalem. We're told that the throne of God and of the Lamb is the new Jerusalem. You see, God lives and reigns in heaven right now. And at this stage of creation's life, this stage of, of history, He will actually put heaven and earth together. He will actually dwell. The new earth will be a new heaven, if you will. Now, <clears throat> the new Jerusalem does not remain in heaven far off out of space somewhere. My understanding of what I read out of Isaiah and Revelation is that heaven and earth, which is right now separated, will be merged. And his throne will be in the new Jerusalem. So let me give you this picture. According to the scriptures that the heaven and the earth will be merged into one. And it's, that's the new heaven, the new earth. Okay? And the new Jerusalem, which is the city of God, which is where the throne of God will be, it will either be one of two things. It will either be in the scriptures, there's debate in it, as to whether or not it will actually be in this new heaven and new earth residing here, or that the new Jerusalem will actually be a floating city, just like you see in Star Wars and other things, a floating city that you can look outside last night and see the moon, for a little bit you could, that you would be able to look out and see that right above the earth you would see a floating city, huge as can be, and people traversing back and forth from it. Just like if we were to go to Washington, D.C. as the capital city, we would travel linearly here on geographically to Washington, D.C. It's the capital of this country. Well, the capital of the world will be the New Jerusalem, and people will traverse back and forth to that place. It's what the Scriptures teach us. Listen to me, folks. God never gave up His original plan for human beings to dwell on earth. Even when He brought the flood on the earth to do away with sin. He didn't destroy the earth, right? The earth was made new. Why? How do we know that? He sent raven after raven out of the ark, and nothing came back. When the dove came back, he had a new twig. He had a brand new blossom. What did it mean? The earth is restored brand new. It's made new. God will restore us once again, he never gave up on the plan for us to be here. We will be enjoying a resurrected life in a resurrected body with, Christ, with a resurrected Christ on a resurrected earth. He will restore to us what we once were in the garden. He will designate and design us to be fully embodied in righteous people. He's going to restore the universe. 2 Peter 3 in Revelation 21 says that the old earth will pass away. So let me ask you this. 
when people pass away, they do not, they do not cease to exist. Right? But the present condition passes away. We have seen a body laid here. That person didn't fail to exist. You saw them as you paid your last respects to whoever it may have been. Over the years, you've seen a person laid here in a casket. They didn't cease to exist. There's their body. They still existed. They've just passed to a different condition. And so that's what the Scriptures are teaching us about this kind of situation. The earth, there are those who do believe that the earth will be burned up and totally destroyed and a new one put in its place. My suggestion is to you that I don't, I don't hold to that view. I don't believe because based on what I've seen God do so far. He's not destroyed. Why do we have all these other planets out there? Couldn't he have just destroyed them all and put them in, into annihilation and they no longer existed and it's just the earth? Why are they still there? Why didn't he just destroy the entire earth and start creation all over again rather than give us the story of Noah? Why did, why did he restore all of the earth? There is places that suggest that the earth will actually go through a transition from one condition to a next rather than cease to exist. It will not be swept into oblivion. There are some scholars who contend that the body of the, of the Scripture evidence leans toward the fact that there would be destruction of creation rather than a transition of it. Well, that might be. I'm going to give you the notes, and I'm going to let you read them on your own. Because in the notes you're going to get next week, what you will find at this point is that there is the debate within the notes. It will show you the debate of those that believe that the earth will be totally destroyed and annihilated and that God will start over creating a brand new earth. Well, where are we going to be in the meantime? Are we Are going to be hanging out in space? He didn't do that the first time. He didn't create man the first day and just hung us out there on a star somewhere while he created the earth. He created all of the condition for man to live before he put man in the earth. Where would we be if he destroyed the, the earth? Is it going to be like an old car traded in for a new car? The Bible says that he is going to make new. He's going to remake it. He's going to give it a facelift. He'll take it back. That thing some of you are wearing right now, I'm going to put on when I leave. You won't ever see them again. It's amazing. What will life be like in the new heaven and the new earth? Well, let me just give you a little bit of a picture in closing. The sun and the moon and the stars will be restored in an original beauty and splendor and purpose. The planet that is now groaning to be relieved from the curse of sin will be washed away from the curse. It will be reversed and the wonderful eternal earth will come forth. Romans 8 declares, for we know that the whole creation groans and travails in pain right now. But there will come a day when the earth is free from the curse. And there won't be the earthquakes and the volcanoes and the, de the, and the deserts. You know there won't be deserts, even as beautiful as some of those pictures are. Many scholars say that deserts are actually simply dead places from the curse. I don't know about all that. I'm not here to debate the science of that. But I just know that everything that lives in the touch of God grows. You do understand that. You can't be a Christian and not grow. Because everything that Jesus touches and restores grows. Everything in the kingdom of God grows. 
stubbornness and pride and prejudice and racism and sin, all of that is, is bondage to clamp down to keep you from growing. But everything in the kingdom grows. The Bible tells us that nations, oh, listen to this. Go read it, Revelation 21, uh, 23, 24, somewhere in there. Nations of saved people. Did you hear that? We're not even a nation of saved people. Revelation says that there will be nations of saved people living on the earth, walking in the light of the new Jerusalem. And these nations on the earth will bring their glory and honor to Christ who will be reigning in that new Jerusalem. Here's the bottom line. When we get to part four of that movie, the eternal ages, the new heaven and the new earth, when all of the judgment of sin and the curse has been, the gavel has struck, and finality is there on that. And it is as it was and is supposed to be. There will be no more tears. <laughs> Tommy, I won't have to walk up to you no more and you start crying on me. <laughs> Every time I walk up to her, she starts crying. Like, is my breath that bad? I mean, what in the world does she start crying every time I walk up to her? There will be no more death. There will be no more sorrowing. No heart will ever bleed in secret of a wounding from the hap what's happened in earth. There will be no more pain. There will be no more fatigue. Devin, you will have the energy of that little boy. We watched go round and round a few Sundays ago, just kept going, and we said, boy, we could bottle it all up. You'll have it. There won't be that fatigue. Everything about this old life will be over. It's hard to imagine, isn't it? Isn't it hard to imagine? You remember the video from this past Wednesday when uh, Joni uh, Erickson Tata said that people come up to her and wonder about her getting out of that wheelchair, and she says, don't assume that the first thing I'm going to want to do when I get to heaven is jump up out of this wheelchair and run. She said, I'm looking forward to a new heart, one that doesn't feel the shame and the guilt and the weight of sin and sorrow and selfishness and sickness. I'm looking forward to a new heart that feels light as a feather and carries the rejoicing and the joy that passes all understanding. And I loved her line at the end. She said, a new heart beats a new body any day. First time I heard that, I thought, wow. Lord, I've just been picturing myself looking in the mirror at an Elvis Presley head of hair. I hadn't even thought about a new heart. I won't go to bed with fear, with sorrow, with worry. Will you? It's hard to imagine a world totally good and completely without sin. And I know we're living in a day and age where everybody says all that is is Disney World. Now let me just tell you something. 
If that's true, if that's true, if this is just a bunch of malarkey, if all of this Christian stuff is nothing at all, and when I die, I go into the ground, and that's it. If that's true, I would rather live this life in the face of fear and worry and sorrow with a hope that keeps me going and get there and realize it's not than to ever live this world without the hope of knowing that the Word of God is true and the presence and promise of God is true. I'm telling you this morning that heaven is a real promise and a real place and a real presence. And it makes it all worth it. I could end it today, but we're going to end it next Sunday. Because I've got some math to tell you about next Sunday. If you're a math person, be here. There ain't but 7 billion people in the world today. Why will there be probably 80 billion people in heaven? Have you thought about that? How big is heaven? How big is the new earth and the new Jerusalem? How big is it? And if there's only 7 billion people on the planet today, how in the world is there going to be 80 billion people in? I'm, not, I'm just giving you a, a roundabout figure. That's not an exact figure. We're going to talk about some math next week. Because maybe we're only talking about the 7 billion people that are alive today. But how many other times have there been 7 billion people over the last 6,000 years of the earth's existence? You remember the guy in the video Wednesday night? The black gentleman who said that when he got to heaven, he, he died and went to heaven and came back. But that when he got to heaven, not only did he meet his grandmother, but he met generation after generation after generation of his family who had died hundreds of years ago, who had made it to heaven. Heaven's bigger than we realize. There's a Christian psychologist out there. I showed you her video several years ago. I can't remember her name now. She's an Australian lady. But she, she wrote the, um, um, I forgot now, who turned off my brain or something like that. I forgot what the title of it was. But she is a scientist. And they did the study of the capacity of the brain. The storage space of the capacity of the brain. Are you hearing me now? I don't know how they quantified it. I don't know how they studied it, but they did a study. And I remember shutting the video off the first time I ever, read, or first time I ever watched this. When they were showing x-rays of the brain and they were showing how it compartmentalizes. And, and here's what it said. The brain has the ability for three million years of storage. We can't remember where we put our keys. <laughs> Somebody said, Pastor Mark, I don't believe that because we can't even remember what the date is today. I said, that's the, that's the, that's the curse of the sin has affected that brain. Why, why, why would you need that much memory unless you were built for heaven? You will not get to heaven, as we heard Wednesday night, and know all there is to know about heaven. You will still be learning when you're in heaven because you will never know all there is about God. But he's going to want you to remember everything about him. <laughs> Stand with me. Phenomenal. I have to figure out what her name is and if you want to hunt it down. It's been several years ago. I, I read about it. First time I read her, read her book and watched her videos, it was 12 years ago, 10 or 12 years ago. Um, phenomenal job because she talked about she actually was able to show x-rays to show you how unforgiveness works in the brain and show these little things called sand spurs in the brain 
that are places of unforgiveness that we hold on to and how it affects us physically. Fascinating study. But the biggest point to me was three million years of memory. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. Will you just lift up a praise right now? Not for what I've said. Just, just honor Him. Just praise Him right now. Just worship Him. Just raise your voices and raise your hands and just take a moment to worship the Lord before I close us in prayer. For everything I've shared with you today comes from the Scriptures. It's the Scripture. It's the promise of God's Word. Just worship Him right now. Oh, we just worship Him. Oh, Lord, we just thank you. Oh, God, I just thank you. The river that will flow from the throne of God and and on either side of the river that there will be all seasons that we experience here on earth and there will be a never-ending cycle of fruit, of peace, of joy. Oh, God. We need this message. In the hearts of our children, in the hearts of our kids, in the hearts of of those people who are lost and seeking throughout the world, they need the message of heaven. Have mercy, I pray, Holy Spirit, have mercy. Pour out the message of heaven across this land. Oh, we worship you. We thank you for this day. We thank you for this country and for what it means. Even in the brokenness and the curse of sin, even through that, you still teach us about freedom to give us just a glimpse of what true freedom is in you. I pray that the God of peace presence be upon this congregation today. Be with each person here today. Minister your whispers of your word into each and every life, I pray. If there be one here today who does not know the God of heaven, Lord, right now, Holy Spirit, you can quicken their heart and show them that all they have to do is confess with their mouth that I need this God, that I am a sinner. And I need a change in my life. And all they have to do is ask you to forgive them. And you will come into their heart and begin to transform their mess into the message of heaven. Release that Holy Spirit into lives all over this place. Fill us by your anointing and your presence to go forth. For it's in the name of Christ we pray.